Hey, thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Ray Sweet. I'm the lead pastor at First Christian Church of Greensburg, Indiana. And as always, we'd love for you to check us out more at FCCGreensburg.com or you can go to the FCC Greensburg Facebook page. But hey, our hearts are all about getting into this word of God, but most of all, letting this word get into us and change us and mold us more and more into the image of Jesus. Now, one of my wife's favorite stories is about a young boy named Ted. Even his fifth grade teacher, Miss Thompson, she wasn't impressed at first. Very sloppy in appearance, he didn't show a whole lot of expression or emotion, and he really had no interest in school. She even admitted, if she was honest, that she kind of enjoyed burying her red uh, pen down as she made many X's on those wrong answers. Perhaps, though, she should have studied his records a little closer. Here's how they read. First grade, Ted shows promise with his work and attitude, but has a poor home situation. Second grade, Ted could do better. Mother seriously ill, receives little help from home. Third grade, Ted is a good boy, but he's too serious. He's a slow learner, and his mother died this year. Fourth grade, Ted is very slow but well behaved. His father shows no interest. Well, as Christmas arrived that year, all the children placed very nicely wrapped gifts on Mrs. Thompson's desk. And then there was Ted's gift. It was wrapped up in kind of a, a crinkled up brown paper and it was covered with scotch tape. And as she slowly opened each gift, the kids got so excited and they cheered. But then things kind of got quiet as she came to Ted's gift. And as she picked it up, a gaudy rhinestone bracelet fell out that was missing half the stones. She also found inside a bottle of cheap perfume. Immediately the kids started to laugh, but she quickly quieted them down by putting on the bracelet and splashing some perfume on her wrist. At the end of the day, as each of the children left, she noticed that Ted was kind of hanging around. Finally, he sheepishly came up to her desk and said, "Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother, and the bracelet looks really nice on you too. I'm so glad that you like my presence. Well, as he left, she couldn't hold it back any longer, and the tears began to stream down her cheeks. She got on her knees right there by her desk, and she begged God to forgive her and change her attitude. And I'm telling you, that next day, the kids were met by a teacher who had been changed completely, who was now committed to loving every child, especially the rougher ones, especially Ted. And as she began to pour into him, he started to show great improvement, even caught up with the rest of the students and passed a few by the end of the year. As time went on and, and Ted advanced on with his schooling, Miss Thompson lost contact until one day she got this letter from him. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know I will be graduating second in my high school class. Love, Ted. And then four years later, another note arrived. Dear Miss Thompson, they just told me that I'll be graduating first in my class. I wanted you to be the first to know the university. It's not been easy, but I liked it. Love, Ted. And then four years after that, she gets this letter. Dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stollard, M.D. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm getting married next month, the 27th to be exact, and I want you to come and sit where my mother would have sat if she were alive. You are now the only family that I have left. Dad died last year, and you better believe Miss Thompson attended that wedding, and with tears streaming down her face, she proudly sat in that place of honor. Now, I think, as we all know from experience, that love is a powerful, powerful thing. And today, as we continue in our series all about the secret of living for Jesus, we'll continue zooming in even more. So if you're new with us today, go ahead and grab your Bibles if you'd like to follow along. Go to John chapter 15, John 15, and so far in this series, we've started out with kind of the, the big picture. And the big picture of this series is this, the secret to living 
is fruit bearing. And then we zoomed in just a little bit more and said, okay, the secret to fruit bearing is abiding. And then even further, the secret to abiding is obeying. And then today, we're going to talk about how the secret to obeying is loving. Now, that story about Ted Stollard holds a very special place in my heart because on a smaller scale, I experienced that same love by a teacher at North Decatur. To be honest, she was a unique personality that some kids really liked, and let's listen, others just didn't. And yet, she spoke some powerful truth into this insecure 17-year-old kid who was lost and didn't have much self-worth. Little did I know that she was a follower of Jesus and that I would be too probably about a year later as God continued to put more people in my path to water that seed. But I'll never forget when I questioned whether I was smart enough to go to college, she looked at me and she said, Ray, not only can you do it, but you will. See, love is a powerful thing. And more potent than the love of a teacher that believes in you or a parent who sacrifices so much or even a spouse who doesn't give up on you. Even a soldier who selflessly serves or gives their life for your freedoms. Even more powerful is the love of God that he has displayed and continues to show for you and me. A God of grace and justice who saw his creation in its sinful state and he made a way. Jesus, God of the flesh, came to this earth, lived a sinless, perfect life, and died on the cross to take our place, to say, I love you big time. And then things got quiet for the rest of Friday, all day Saturday, and into Sunday morning, what the Jewish culture called three days. But when when light broke through that morning, The grave could hold him no longer, and Jesus came busting out of that tomb to offer us life on this earth and life eternal. And because he is resurrected, those who choose to pick up their cross and follow him will be resurrected to eternal life in heaven. Church, there is nothing like the agape love that has been shown to us. And what I want you to see today is that the secret to obeying the Lord is is truly loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength because of His great compassion, mercy, and grace. So, let's look at our main passage today. You should have your Bible open here to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, and let's read verses 9 and 10. It says, as the Father, Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. Now, once again, I want to give credit where it's due. So the series is based off of a little purple book by Warren Wearsby called Abide. And I want to show you some some powerful truths that he points out and that we'll even continue to expand upon. So let's talk today about three levels of obedience. Because remember, with Jesus, motives matter. And here's the first level of obedience, selfishness. See, this is where we obey because we need to, because we get something out of it. We see this with a, a comment that, Uh, the Apostle Peter uh, makes well before he's an apostle uh, to Jesus in in Matthew 19, 27. He says, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? See, this is the kind of like a, a teenager learning that when I obey, there are often perks that come with it. And listen, Peter would continue to grow and grow in his faith and that selfishness would start to fade even more. And sadly, we see a lot of Christians live this way. My obedience is measured by what God is giving me. And if I don't get what I want, then man, I'm gone. And church, let's just be honest, that's selfishness. If you remember back probably about three months ago, we looked at a story from the book of Daniel. And we talked about those three Hebrews named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men were were faithful followers of Yahweh, who we worship here today. And they refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue. They rejected worshiping any idols 
made by human hands. And when the king threatened to heat up the fiery furnace and throw them in it, killing them, here's what they said in Daniel 3, starting in verse 17. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Now, man, I love that passage. Their faith wasn't just built on everything in their life going perfect and God always giving them exactly what they wanted. They truly loved and worshipped their creator with all their heart. And they made it very clear by this bold declaration. So the first level of obedience is selfishness. The second one is fear. See, this is the we have to or else we're in big trouble type of obedience. Now, let me say this. There is a difference between human fear and a good and holy fear. The Bible calls this the fear of the Lord, which is a beautiful, beautiful blend of love, reverence, respect, and awe, because He is God and I am not. This isn't the fear that a slave shows a master, but instead the respect a son shows a father. And in John chapter 15, uh, actually verse 15, Jesus actually says it like this. He says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. So when we think about a a human fear, like, Lord, I'll do what you want because I don't want you to smite me, that's not a healthy obedience, okay? And yet so many people see God as this kind of big guy in the sky who throws down his lightning bolts when I'm bad and he blesses me when I'm good. And this type of false understanding uh, and and man-made view of God, that will drain your joy in a heartbeat. See, Warren Wearsby actually put it like this. He said, fear can rob us of the real joys that God wants us to experience because we obey him. Now, let's dwell for the rest of our time here on the highest motive for obedience, and that's love. See, if we look at John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. Very simple. If you love me, keep my commands. So for the rest of our time, let's answer this question. Why is, the lo- why is love the highest motivation for obedience? Why is love the highest motivation for obedience? And here's the first reason. Because love focuses on the giver and not the gift. You know, it's pretty common that, that young girls uh, will dream of their engagement and wedding day, where I think most guys don't think of it much until they fall in love and they're ready to propose. And while every girl envisions that special moment when her true love will get down on one knee and ask her to marry him, that moment isn't so much about the gift. It's more so about the giver. Here's what I mean by that. Ladies, imagine that a random guy that you've never met comes up to you with a beautiful diamond ring. He gets down on one knee and he asks you to marry him. Now, unless you're just super desperate or a gold digger, you're going to be like, no way, man. I don't even know you, okay? And that gift is only special. That ring is only special because of the one who gives it and the bond I have with them. And one reason why love is the highest motivation for obedience is because love focuses on that relationship with Christ. It's not about what I get. It's about my Savior who loved me and died for me. It's all about the privilege I have to walk in a relationship with Him every single day. Now, if we go back to the Old Testament to the story of Job. Job was a a godly man who had been blessed by the Lord in so many ways. He also had 10 children, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and many workers. That's what you call filthy rich in those days. 
And that's when Satan says to God that he's only a godly man because all the blessings you give him, if you remove them, he'll surely curse you. So the Lord allows Satan to take away those things, but not to kill Job. So one by one, messengers come to tell him all these awful things, that all his animals and workers are gone. Even his children have been killed when the house they were all in collapsed on them. Almost every earthly possession taken away from him in a heartbeat. And here's what Job 1, 20 and 21 says. It says, At this Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head, which would have been customary of their culture to show that grief and that pain. And then it says, Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, He said, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Watch this. May the name of the Lord be praised. Wow. Man, that that just is so countercultural. See, love focuses on the giver and not the gift. And then next, love is the highest motivation for obedience because love doesn't measure sacrifice. Love doesn't measure sacrifice. See, in John 15, verse 13, Jesus actually puts it like this. He says, Greater love has no other, no one other than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And once again, the ultimate example of that is Jesus, who didn't measure the, the level of his sacrifice for us, but willingly went to the cross out of love. And when we return that love to him, we don't measure the cost of obeying his word because love simply obeys. You know, it reminds me of a story from 2010 where the Merkel family was enjoying a nice evening at home when suddenly they smelled smoke. And before they knew it, the house was starting to become engulfed in flames. In pure panic, 36-year-old Jacob and his wife grabbed the three kids of theirs that were close. They quickly got them outside, only to discover that their 13-year-old son was nowhere to be seen. And even though the fire was becoming intense, Jacob didn't think of his own safety at all. But he ran quickly back through the house, down to the basement. He scooped up his son Kai, and he flew through the house, dodging the fire, dodging the debris. And as he stepped through the front door, I mean, as his foot was crossing that threshold, there was an explosion that happened behind him. And he quickly shoved his son to safety But sadly, he took the brunt of that explosion that ended up taking his life. See, as a parent, as a grandparent, a spouse, a friend, many of us would do whatever it takes to save those that we care about, right? Because love doesn't measure the level of sacrifice. And when it comes to our relationship with Christ, knowing what he did for us, knowing the depth of his love and sacrifice, When we choose to follow him, when we choose to love him back, we are choosing to obey regardless of the cost because love that calculates is not true love. And then third, the last thing I want you to see, love is the highest motivation for obedience because God is love. Because God is love. You know, one of my favorite quotes from uh, the little book that we've been talking about called Abide is when Warren Wearsby says, God gives his commandments because he loves us. And because we love him, we obey his commandments. We do not question them or seek to change them. We do not fear his will. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, as he quotes 1 John 4.18. See, that passage is very special to me because it takes me back to the summer of 07. I had met Bethany in December of 06, and pretty quickly I knew that God had answered my prayer for a godly woman who would love me with all my quirks. We truly connected on such a deep level from the start, and we officially became, I guess you call it boyfriend-girlfriend, on January the 1st of that year. And while the people who always told me that when I met the right girl, I'd know it, and that always drove me crazy until I did, and then it made sense, but I now realize that they were right. And both of us could see that God was in our relationship, and he had a purpose bigger than we could even understand. 
as she graduated from college that spring and assumed her normal summer schedule at the time of working at Mahoning Valley Camp, we just couldn't spend enough time together. And as she continued to remind me that she was ready to marry me, I was so grateful. And yet I became very overwhelmed. Anybody on our, our church staff could tell you that, that sometimes I can appear a little bit as a buzzkill when I really don't mean to, because when someone throws out a big picture idea to me, my mind immediately starts to figure out all the details to how we can accomplish that. And while I think that can be really helpful, it can scare people who just want you to say, oh yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> well, little did Bethany know, when she talked constantly about us getting married, in my mind, that was just intimidating. I had to figure out, okay, how am I gonna provide for her? Where would we live? Uh, whether I was really ready to make a, a true lifelong commitment like that, and the list goes on. So I got really overwhelmed. And one day I told her, hey, something honestly you shouldn't say in a relationship, but I just said I need some time and I need some space. And little did I know she took that as, oh no, he's going to break up with me. So when we finally came back together to talk, she gave me a Bible with 1 John 4.18 highlighted that says there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And then we fast forwarding and maybe just a couple months here, I had just accepted my first full-time ministry, preaching at a little country church not far from the camp. We had been there kind of painting the, the church parsonage, the church house where I would live at first and then she would join me when we got married. I devised this grand plan to propose to her I planned out the whole evening that kind of brought in some elements of things that had been special to us throughout our dating relationship. That's so sweet. <laughs> and the night was going to end at our future residence. It's beautiful. And as she walked into the house, I had rose petals, and you can see these pictures here. I had rose petals and candles kind of leading the way to a bedroom where there was a, a Bible on the floor with the engagement ring on top of it and communion to the side. And guess what passage I read to her? Yeah, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. And praise God, she said yes, and today we are celebrating 17 years of marriage. Now, bring that back to our love for the Lord. The highest motivation for our obedience is that great reality that God is love. We've talked about his amazing love displayed on the cross, but what about how he daily cares for you and your family? Think about the, the times in your life that you didn't think that you'd make it through this one. And what happened? God was faithful to provide, to protect, and to love you and I more than we deserve. Just last Sunday after the 11 o'clock service, I was talking with a few people about how rough life can be sometimes. We know that, right? And that's when one of them brought up the passage, Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. And that's what Kathy Minkadig summed it up this way. She said, you know, when I think of that verse, I can't help but to kind of sum it up this way. She said, my story for his glory. And that kind of heart towards the Lord happens when we truly love him when we can see that, that our God gave his life on the cross so that we wouldn't have to endure eternal punishment because he loved us. And as we dwell in him, abide in him, and we, we learn his heart and we get in his word, we begin to love him with everything we are. Now go ahead and, and kind of zoom back out with me, okay? So the secret to living is bearing fruit. The secret to bearing fruit is abiding. The secret to abiding is obeying. And today we learn that the secret to obeying is loving. And when you've truly been set free from the bondage of your sin, experiencing the love of God in your life, that's when your motivation for obedience won't be selfishness, it won't be fear, but instead your obedience will flow from love. Why do I want to obey Him? because I love him. And why do I love him? Because he first loved me. Let's pray. 
Father, we are just so grateful for your incredible love that you first loved us the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus gave on the cross to set us free. We are so very thankful and we just worship you today. Father, I just pray that as we have talked through this passage today, I just pray you will help us to be people who obey you, not out of fear, not out of selfishness, but obey you out of pure love for you and how awesome of a God that you are. So Father, have your way in us. Create in us a clean heart, O God, that truly honors you and seeks your face. We love you, Jesus. You are so good. And we pray all this in the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. Hey, before we close today, let me just uh, share with you uh, that if you are watching this and God is just kind of stirring your heart and you have questions about, hey, I, I want to follow Jesus. I want to know this love that, that you've been talking about today. Well, listen, I would love to come alongside you. We here at First Christian Church of Greensburg, Indiana, uh, we'd love to come alongside you. So here's a couple ways you can connect with us. Uh, you can call the church office. We're open Monday through Thursday from 8 to 4.30. Call the church office uh, at 812-663-8488. That's 812-663-8488. Or you can email me at ray at fccgreensburg.com. Hey, God bless you. I hope you have a fantastic week.